All right, welcome to Bibliology and Bible Overview, BI 101, brought to you by the New Covenant College, taught here at the New Testament Baptist Church Institute in Dover, Tennessee. We finally have made it to the end of our studies in this course. Uh, we are now looking at lesson number 18, module 18, if you're in our online platform. And we will come now to our final lecture and take into our consideration the general epistles of the New Testament. The general epistles. We looked last week at the Pauline epistles, and now we are looking at the general epistles. The general epistles are so titled uh, because they are not addressed to a specific locality, such as a church in a particular city, rather, but they're just more general, right? And the significance and the importance of the New Testament epistles as a whole we considered last week. So we're not going to rehash any of that information. Uh, you're aware that an epistle is a letter and uh, that there it's, it's dialogue that's written to someone and it's didactic teaching. And when we come to these general epistles, we find that they're not written to churches. Uh, they're general. Now, as I mentioned last week, because of our time constraints in this class, we, we had to kind of throw some books together, and so I want to make this mention up front. There are some exceptions to our titling this lecture General Epistles. For instance, the book of Hebrews is typically not really considered a general epistle. Um, number one, because it's, it's written to the Hebrews, <laughs> and uh, also because of the debate over its authorship. The debate over its authorship. And uh, we mentioned last week, the, the scholarly position is to say that the book of Hebrews is anonymous. And truth be told, it is anonymous. Uh, however, there's a general consensus amongst most scholars that it was indeed written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, playing with my cards face up, I believe that it was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, but to be scholarly, we're going to just consider that as a general epistle. Uh, second and third John are also kind of an exception because they're technically not general. They're addressed to specific individuals. And Revelation is sometimes categorized as a general epistle, but typically not because uh, it is really a kind of a lone New Testament prophetic book. It's, uh, it's different. But for simplicity's sake, we're just going to consider everything that's not uh, undeniably written by Paul as a general epistle, and we'll get over the bumps as we come to them. Uh, these letters supplement the theology and the practice taught in the Pauline epistles. Now, uh, God could have used one man to write all of the epistles, but in his wisdom he chose not to. And he used a multitude of men, Paul primarily, but also these other men, who offer their own unique points of view and provide the biblical reader with a variety of perspectives. Now, of course, there's no contradictions, again, between Paul's writings and James or Peter or whoever, uh, but they provide their own unique contributions in the same way that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John complement one another writing the Gospels. So too do we find that to be the case with the epistles. So let's look at the content of these epistles. The first one we'll consider is the book of Hebrews. Hebrews. Now the authorship is deb debated, but again, strong argumentation uh, suggests that it was also written by the Apostle Paul. I believe John Owen, in his wonderful work on Hebrews, spends a great deal of time uh, arguing for a Pauline authorship and explaining why it was Paul, um, and also explaining perhaps why Paul wouldn't have put his name on the epistle and just uh, all of those arguments. So if you want to nerd out on that stuff, go get you a copy of John Owen's work on Hebrews, and uh, you, can, you can have at it. As the name implies... The letter was written to Hebrew Christians in the first century. And uh, this is very important for us to note because it presents us with unique interpretation challenges. Now, when you're reading Hebrews, you don't need to read Hebrews like a 21st century Gentile. You need to read Hebrews like a first century Jewish Christian or Jew who had converted to Christianity. Right? Why? Well, because that's who it was written to. And so the language that's heavily leaning on the audience was someone who was very familiar with the Old Testament. Right? And so if you're going to understand Hebrews, you need to take that into consideration. Uh, though this book can be difficult to interpret, the central theme 
of Christ's surpassing excellence is very pronounced in this epistle. The writer demonstrates how Christ is better than the prophets, better than the angels, better than Moses, better than the Aaronic priesthood, better than the temple worship, better than all the types and all the pictures um, because they were all intended to point to Him. And that's the central driving point that Hebrews is making. And so when you run across a particular passage or paragraph in Hebrews that you don't quite understand, don't let it fret you. Uh, just understand that uh, Hebrews is all about the surpassing excellence of Christ. The key words in Hebrews, uh, better, perfect, heavenly, right? New. We see this, this concurrent running theme in Hebrews. And it also reminds us, Hebrews reminds us, that if we reject Christ and salvation in His gospel, we have nowhere else to turn. Where, 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 where are we going to go? As the Hebrew writer said, what shall we do? Where shall we go? Where shall we turn if we neglect so great a salvation? He says, that, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? See, you can't go back to the rudimentary ceremonies of the Old Testament. Because Christ is better than them. And so if Christ is not good enough for you, you can't go back to them. Right? That's, that's what Hebrews is driving home for us. So we have that book. Glorious book. Wonderful book. I recommend studying it. I recommend learning it. Uh, you'll be greatly blessed. Then we have the book of James. The book of James. James deals with the relationship between our faith and our works. Between our faith and our works. James details the fundamentals of practical religion. James is a very practical book, very straightforward book. It can actually be kind of a sticky and condemning book as it deals with issues of ethics and the consistency required between what Christians believe and how they live. James does not beat around the bush. Uh, James says that if your works don't match up with your faith, your faith is dead. And God does not save anyone with a dead faith, but with a living faith. And uh, James can be very uh, straightforward, especially when he talks about the tongue and the power that we have with our words as Christians. Uh, uh, anybody that reads that and is not convicted has probably never experienced uh, regeneration. <laughs> because if you are a Christian who knows the Lord and you read those, you, you must admit that you're looking into a mirror, that, that you are... Uh, convicted in that you are found guilty of the charges found in the book of James concerning our own personal conduct. First and Second Peter uh, are the next of the general epistles. And uh, in First Peter, Peter provides us with practical directions for Christians facing persecution. Peter is writing there to believers who are experiencing uh, pushback for their faith, and he calls us to place our mind upon heavenly realities and calls, calls us to think of heavenly things and to remember those realities, but he also, in doing so, not to forsake our obligations as Christians in the unbelieving world. Um, Christians are to be people who allow the birds to fly over their head but not make a nest in their hair. It's a wonderful thing. As a matter of fact, it's, a, it's an absolute must for the church to be in the world. But oh, how terrible it is for the world to be in the church. So that's what Peter is explaining to us here. Thus, Peter deals with the connection between doctrine and practice, and he speaks specifically to those who have been called to shepherd the flock of God. To pastors, to elders, he, he deals specifically with them. Now, Second Peter continues this theme and deals with the sobering reality of apostasy. As a result of persecution, uh, many false converts, those who never truly were a part of the faith, apostatize and leave the faith. And false converts and false teachers are an ever-present struggle in confessing, professing Christianity. There are those who think that... Uh, that just now, in our, our own day and age, we're starting to see those fall away from the faith. Well, the truth of the matter is that's, that's an ever-present reality. And uh, we're not to anticipate a, a great downturn of religion or a great falling away, but rather we're to anticipate the victory of Christ's gospel, but yet the truth of apostasy is ever-present. So we need to keep that in mind. 
First, second, and third John, the Johannine epistles. Uh, Johannine, of course, you know, Petrine, Pauline, it's just uh, a fancy way of making these names modifiers for the epistles. So the, the Johannine epistles are the epistles written by John. They deal with various issues concerning Christian fellowship, concerning Christian fellowship. Um, both deal with each other and with God. Both deal with each other and with God. And uh, there is most audaciously seen, this is most audaciously seen in 1 John, as the author speaks very practically and directly into the hearts of those who profess the faith. Um, read the first chapter and the second chapter of 1 John, and you will find tests, very practical, straightforward tests to see if you are really in the faith. John says, if you believe, then this will be true. If you don't believe, then this will be true. And we need to take heed when we read those kind of warnings in the Word of God. Uh, truth and love and obedience are also themes that run throughout these short epistles. John speaks very practically to our heart. In 2 John, there is a special emphasis placed upon the importance of walking in the truth. John teaches us that those who apostatize and depart from the faith only manifest that they were never inward partakers of God's grace to begin with, but only external professors, only external professors. John also deals with the Christian charity and hospitality as highlighted in 3 John and uh, let me say this to you as well. Uh, though there is some debate, it's safe to say that it is the disciple whom Jesus loved. It is that John who wrote the gospel, who wrote the three uh, uh, short epistles, and who will also write Revelation. It's the same John there mentioned all throughout. And he is quoted there in his uh, gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And uh, uh, he speaks much about the importance of Christian love for one another. Then we have, of course, that short book there, the book of Jude. Jude deals, again, a lot about uh, apostasy and falling away. But not only does it deal with apostasy, but it also deals with the persevering grace of God that keeps His people in the faith. And to Him, that will keep you from falling and present you blameless, right? So we see those two realities running parallel throughout the short book of Jude. Really, it's just a chapter of Jude. Uh, but again, it's interesting to note how a lot of these general epistles deal with the subject of true faith, true religion, and the reality of apostasy. And then we come lastly to the last book of the Bible. We've made it all the way through. We began with Genesis, and now here we are in the book of Revelation. Revelation is perhaps the most difficult book of the Bible to interpret. Uh, that is due to the nature of its literature. Revelation is, is not as didactic and narrative as the other epistles are, though it is a letter. It is uh, written to the seven churches of Asia Minor, and John, when he was exiled on the island of Patmos, was called upon by the Lord Jesus himself to write this letter. Uh, and uh, Revelation, though it is unique, we have to understand that it is an epistle, and God chose to culminate His revealing Himself to man with a prophetic portion of Scripture. Keep that in mind. Uh, this is the book that God has chosen to be the last providentially in the canon. Uh, the word Revelation comes from its title in the Greek Bible, uh, Apocalypsis, is uh, just the revealing or the unveiling. And so that's what Revelation is. Here's another pet peeve. We talked about Psalms, the book of Psalms, and how we don't say chapter such and such or Psalms 30. It's just Psalm 30. Well, it's not Revelations. It's Revelation. There's one revelation, and it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is what the whole book is about. Now, Obviously, time does not permit us to get into all of the hermeneutical nuances of Revelation, but if you will keep in mind that Jesus Christ is the central theme of Revelation, it will save you. Uh, attack helicopters and China and Russia and uh, all of these other things are not the theme of Revelation. They're not in Revelation. Jesus Christ is in Revelation, and that will help you uh, as you are studying that book. The meat of that book consists of visions that Jesus revealed to John while he was on the island of Patmos. 
And we ha he has a series of visions. Probably all came to him at one point, at one time, but uh, he records them in, in a series. And uh, again, there's uh, so many different ways to view the interpreting of the book of Revelation. And we don't have time to get into the depths of them and uh, argue for one or the other. But I do want to give you the four main views of Revelation. Okay, so the first main view of interpreting Revelation is what we would call the preterist view. The preterist view. Uh, now, the preterist view teaches that Revelation is primarily about events that took place in the past. And when we say preterist, uh, preterist is pretty much always synonymous with partial preterists. Uh, and a partial preterist would say um, that everything in Revelation, except for the last couple of chapters, has already been fulfilled. Uh, it's speaking about 70 AD. It's speaking about the destruction of the temple. And... Uh, it's already been fulfilled. They would say that the only thing left is the second coming. Jesus will come bodily and visibly, and he will take his people, uh, and uh, the world will be purged, new heavens and new earth. But there's no future literal kingdom. There's no conversion of the Jews. There's no golden age. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's none of this necessarily. It's just preterist. It's, it's, par it's partial preterist. It's been fulfilled. I, uh, there are those who believe before the second coming, that there will be either a, an increase in, in the spread of the gospel or a decrease, but they don't believe in any kind of eschatological, physical kingdom. That's, that's uh, oh, I should uh, explain that to you. The second position is the futurist position. Well, if the preterist position is all in the past, you guessed it, the futurist position is pretty much all in the future. So whereas the preterist says, Revelation is completely fulfilled except for the last couple of chapters. Most futurists, though there are some differences, most futurists would say at the beginning of chapter 4, some would say around chapter 6, but the bulk of Revelation has not occurred. That's, that's the futurist position. Um, the futurist and preterist positions, I, I feel safe to say that they're, they're both kind of fairly newer ways to look at Revelation. Uh, to look at it as either all in the past or all in the future. Um, the futurist position, if, of course, is the, the foundation for the, the resurgence, or should I say this, the emergence of premillennialism in the, um, in the 19th and 20th centuries. You have to also understand that um, the, one's millennial position is different than the way he might interpret the whole book as a whole. One's millennial position is simply derived from the way he would interpret, say, chapter 20 in view of the rest of the Bible. Uh, so when, when someone is, let's say, premillennial, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a strict futurist. Or if someone is, say, amillennial, it doesn't mean that they're a strict preterist, right? Uh, and we'll see how that's possible with the other three views. So preterist, all in the past, Think, think of it that way. Futurist, pretty much all in the future. Uh, that They say that the visions are talking about coming realities, right? The futurist position does. The third view is what we call the historicist view. Historicist view. Uh, this is the view that was very common around the Reformation period. Uh, it was uh, predominantly held. Most all of your older commentaries will give you this historicist view. I'm thinking of like John Gill and Matthew Henry and others. There's a lot of variation within the historicist view, just like there's a lot of variation within the futurist view, and you'll understand why that is. Preterist view doesn't have as much variation because they would say that everything in Revelation occurred pretty much around 70 AD. So there's not a whole lot of different events where they can find fulfillment. But when you say it's the futurist position, which says that it's all coming to pass off in the future, you've got an endless number of possibilities, right? Well, the historicist position teaches that revelation is uh, not all in the future, not all in the past, but revelation is the symbolic unveiling of church history from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. So everything that takes place in between is uh, purported in the historicist position. Uh, some would hold to a more one-to-one -one ratio. They would, they would feel more comfortable saying, this passage in Revelation points to this specific historical event. This passage points to this specific historical event. 
Others would say that there are passages that might have multiple fulfillments because the passages are not referring to a specific event necessarily, but rather to a specific type of event. Or some would argue even that, yes, there is a specific fulfillment, but there are other events that uh, also uh, would meet the same kind of characteristics. Like, for instance, the historicist position would probably teach, most historicists would say that the mark of the beast, for instance, is the reception of Romanist doctrine. And they would say that because for much of history, um, if, if you were not uh, subservient to Rome, you couldn't buy, trade, or sell, you couldn't participate in society, you were persecuted, right? So they would say that is the fulfillment, but any kind of uh, governmental force or religious opposition that would impose some of the similar restraints would meet the same kind of spirit or, or meet the same kind of characteristics of the event. So that's the historicist position. Uh, then the last one is what we call the idealist position. The idealist position, um, and that is the view that the passages of Revelation do not refer to anything in specific terms, but that Revelation is just all about the grand struggle between good and evil, and uh, different events can fit into multiple different symbols and multiple different prophecies, and uh, they would not be as hard-pressed to find specific fulfillment with something that took place in history or something that will take place in the future. So you can see here, we talked about the whole millennial position, uh, you can see here how somebody could, for instance, they could be a millennial and they might be a partial preterist or they might be an idealist, right? Uh, you, could, you could see how someone could be a premillennialist and be a futurist or a historicist or even possibly partial idealist there, right? So we have to just be very careful that we're understanding these different categories so that we're not falsely aligning someone with something that they don't actually believe. Now, <laughs> Much debate centers around which view is correct, but time will not permit us to go on with explaining which is right and which is uh, wrong and why. I will, however, uh, say that throughout Christian history, I believe there have been good men that have held to uh, a whole different array of these views and combinations of these different views, and it's just like most things in Christianity. Uh, one camp does not have all the answers. Right? And, and when we are uh, so exclusive as to say that we're going to separate from brethren because of their way of interpreting the last book of the Bible, I think that we're getting into deep water that God does not intend for us to get into. Um, it is important, though, of course, to study this book, to understand uh, what it teaches, to understand um, how we are to interpret it so that we can know uh, what we are to learn from the book of Revelation. You ought not approach, approach Revelation dramatically different than you approach the rest of the Bible with no credence given to general consensus or Christian thought. So there's just another warning. Um, if you have come up with a view of Revelation and you have come up with an interpretation to a particular passage of Revelation and there is just no other Christian throughout all of church history that corroborates your view, I'd be very cautious about that view. Just like I'd be very cautious about coming up with an interpretation of Romans 4, for instance, that nobody's ever thought of before, right? Uh, because God gives His truth to His people, right? And we, we don't need to come to Revelation with a dramatically different way of interpretation. Yes, it is prophetic literature. We need to take that into account. Uh, but we don't need to to follow general principles like the grammatical, historical, hermeneutic, say, in all the epistles, but then when we get to Revelation, we just throw that out of the window, right? Because God is not the author of confusion. So, regardless of how one approaches the book, we must all agree that in the book and in time, the gospel is victorious, the church is triumphant, and Christ reigns supreme. And if we, we keep our eyes on Christ, if we look towards Christ to see Him preeminent in the Scriptures, I believe that will save us from faulty interpretations. It's true for Revelation. That's true for other passages as well. Well, this concludes Bibliology 101, and Bibliology and Bible Overview. We are so 
uh, glad that you have made it through this course. I pray that you're encouraged by our study of the authorship, readership, and contents of the Bible. And to sum everything up, what you've seen over these last 18 modules, these last 18 lessons, is that by the inspiration and providential preservation, God has delivered His Word to His people, and He's kept it pure in every age. And by principles of interpretation, we are able to understand it, to know what God would have us to know. And by the contents of the Scripture, the Holy Spirit in His illuminating ministry reveals God to us, His will, His purposes, and His character. So may you be better equipped to serve Christ. May you know your Bibles more. May you have a great, greater hunger for the study of Scripture. And may you endeavor to glorify Christ more and more. Pray that this class has been a blessing to you. And I thank you for tuning in to uh, the New Covenant College and uh, attending here at, at the Institute of the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee. Thank you all and God bless you.